If a governor issued a stay-at-home order... When you say my authority, the president's authority... Not mine, because it's not me. This is... When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. The authority is total. total. It's total. Okay, so I am signing up for Clear because it sounds like a good deal. So Gideon's going to take me through the process. All right, Karen, so what are you going to do first? Let's start with your four right fingers on your right hand and lower that wrist for me. And once you see the fingerprint scoring, you can lift up. There it is. And uh, what it does, it rates all the biometrics. So the green will be good and yellow will be okay. Uh, you're going to start with your left hand now, same way. And lower that wrist. That's perfect. And uh, like I said, the green is good. So that's perfect. All right, so both thumbs at the same time. Let me hold that okay. for you. All right. And lower the wrist and relax the shoulders, just like that. And, yep, it's coming in. You see it there? It's going. You can lift up. All right. And now we're going to do the eyes. So look at oh. it right up here. I don't know if you can see how I'm doing this, but it's kind of cool. Perfect. And look down, you can show the eyes. That's great. That just looks weird. <laughs> okay. And now now we just get in the documents, like your your, your um, photo ID, state ID, um, passport, or military ID. Okay. So make sure you bring one of those with you. And we have to scan both sides. Once you get the ding, that's good. We're all good, verified. I just need a credit card. All right. I'm going to turn off right now because right. i got to pull out my credit card. What we're going to do is we're going to continue here. Uh, just payment update here. And then all we do is put a card on file. Okay. Um, obviously, to put the card on file, nothing is charged. Completely free to do so. Okay. I will do that. And oh. then we have a nice little slide oh. here. So we'll just slide that bad boy through. Oh, easy. Okay. And complete it. Once it's done processing, um, and it's valid. Save it. Um, once this is done processing, like I said, it's about a two or three minute uh, window until the system actually recognizes your card attached to you, and then you'll be able to make purchases um, from then on out as long as you're a clear member. So, so we've just connected to our, my credit card to my clear account, and now we're actually going to test this new concessions technology that Clear has. It's going to read my fingerprint, and that is basically going to take care of payment and age verification. So let's give this a try. All right. Uh, this is our POS system. We'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and make that purchase right now. Okay. okay. Here so, we go. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is just let this gentleman know whatever you want, just like you regularly would. Uh, fingers go down, takes that money off your card, processes, verifies your ID, everything. So. That sounds great, except for the money going off my card yeah, thing. Right. But <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. All right. Um, I would like uh, one Bud Light, please. One Bud Light, absolutely. Here, just put your fingers on the reader. So put my fingers on the reader like that and then you're going to drop your list down. Um, it's going to process you. Once it's done processing you, it's going to verify you. It's going to verify the money on your card. Payment and age confirmed and you're good to go. So that gentleman is going to get you your Bud Light and you'll be on your way. So There's my receipt. Payment and age confirmed. Members 21 are over. Thank you. Payment and age verification brought to you by Clear. And there is the ice cold Bud Light. There you go. Thank you very much. So, so there you go. I didn't have to take out my wallet and it verified my age, and now I have a nice cold Bud Light right before the Seahawks game. Enjoy your game. Thanks, go Hawks. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. 
Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. By those in rebellion against the gospel as the Antichrist and the Antichrist, the last and final Pope of Rome that will be, will be the Antichrist. The Pope will be received, will be welcomed, will be believed as Christ himself on earth. As a matter of fact, we have enough evidence and proof throughout history that in that dynasty, dynasty of popes, already Pope has been declared himself as God on earth, including the present Pope. He is, according to the official title, Vicar of Christ on earth, to as Vicarius Filidae, from which title in Latin come 666. Every syllable in Latin, he gives the value of a Roman number that the total come to be 666. Not only he has the mark, not only he bears the number of a man, but he himself becomes the fusion of these two powers, political and religious power. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. The first seal foretells the rise of the popes, as they claim to be vice-regents of the Savior. They go forth conquering and to conquer. The description of this Antichrist is markedly similar in some ways to that of the real Savior given in Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 14. These similarities have deceived masses who have failed to note the differences. Pope Francis proposes universal basic income. Pope Francis proposed that the world adopt a universal basic wage in a letter published by the Vatican on April 12. Pope Francis wrote a letter to the World Meeting of Popular Movements, an organization that brings grassroots movements together with faith leaders all over the world. According to the Pope, a universal basic wage would acknowledge and dignify the noble, essential tasks, as well as achieve the ideal of no worker without rights. In his letter, the Pope mentioned the hardships many workers are probably facing due to the coronavirus pandemic lockdowns. Pope Francis addressed the informal sector, specifically the street vendors, recyclers, carnies, small farmers, construction workers, dressmakers, 
the different kinds of caregivers. He acknowledged that the ills that afflict everyone hit these informal workers twice as hard. Business news site CNBC reported that the idea of a universal basic income has become more appealing as of late due to the lockdowns and social distancing efforts that have put millions out of work. A universal basic income involves the receipt of regular cash payments with minimal or no requirements. The U.S. Labor Department reported on April 9 that 6.6 .6 million Americans filed for first-time unemployment claims the week before. The U.S. has been one of the hardest hit by the impacts of the pandemic, with the country losing around 10% of its workforce in only three weeks. Laborers worldwide have been suffering and governments have been trying their best to relieve their worries with aid packages and stimulus relief checks. One of those who praised the Pope for suggesting a universal basic income was Andrew Young, an American lawyer who pushed for the concept during his failed 2020 presidential campaign. According to financial news platform MarketWatch, Yang believes that free cash would help solve economic inequality by giving everyone, including those without adequate compensation, a financial safety net. While a universal basic income is appealing and seems to be working during the pandemic, it may still be too expensive to implement in the long run. In his speech, Pope Francis said that he hopes the pandemic will free us from operating on automatic pilot and allow a humanist and ecological conversion. He called on everyone to place human life and dignity at a center instead of idolizing money. What if the state covered your cost of living? Would you still go to work? Go back to school? Not work at all? What would you do? This concept is called a Universal Basic Income, or UBI, and it's nothing less than the most ambitious social policy of our times. In 2017, basic income is gaining momentum around the world. First trials are ongoing or on their way, and a growing number of countries are considering UBI as an alternative to welfare. How would it work, and what are the key arguments for and against? Right now, people can't really agree what universal basic income is or should be. Some want to use it to eliminate welfare and cut bureaucracy. Others want it as a free extra for existing programs, or even want it to be so high that work itself becomes optional. For this video, we'll talk mostly about the minimum basic income, enough money to be above the poverty line. In the US, this means about $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year. The money would not be taxed, and you could do whatever you wanted with it. In this scenario, UBI is a way of transferring the wealth of a society while still keeping the free market intact. But if we hand out free money, will people just spend it on booze and stop working? A 2013 study by the World Bank specifically examined if poor people waste their handouts on tobacco and alcohol if they receive it in the form of cash. The clear answer, no, they don't. The opposite is true. Other studies have shown that the richer you are, the more drugs and alcohol you consume. The lazy and drunk poor person is a stereotype rather than reality. What about laziness? Universal basic income test runs done in Canada in the 1970s showed that around 1% of the recipients stopped working, mostly to take care of their kids. On average, people reduced their working hours by less than 10%. The extra time was used to achieve goals like going back to school or looking for better jobs. But if laziness and drugs are not a huge deal, why doesn't our current welfare state solve poverty? Welfare or unemployment programs often come with a lot of strings attached, like taking part in courses, applying to a certain number of jobs a month, or accepting any kind of job offer, no matter if it's a good fit or what it pays. Besides the loss of personal freedom, these conditions are often a huge waste of time and only serve to make the unemployment statistics seem less bad. Often your time would be much better spent looking for the right job, continuing education or starting a business. 
Another unwanted side effect of many welfare programs is that they trap people in poverty and promote passive behavior. Imagine a benefit of $1,000 each month. In a lot of programs, if you earn a single dollar extra, the whole thing is taken away. If you take a job that's paying $1,200, you might not only lose your benefits, but because of your taxes and other costs like transportation, you might end up having less money than before. So if you actively try to better your situation and your total income is not improving or even shrinking, welfare can create a ceiling that traps people in poverty and rewards passive behavior. A basic income can never be cut and therefore getting a job and additional income will always make your financial situation better. Work is always rewarded. Instead of a ceiling, it creates a floor from which people can lift themselves up. But even if UBI is the better model, is it economically feasible? What about inflation? Won't prices just rise, making everything just like it was before? Since the money is not being created by magic or printers, it needs to be transferred from somewhere. It's more of a shift of funds than the creation of new ones. Hence, no inflation. OK, but how do we pay for it? There's no right answer here because the world is too diverse. How well off a country is, what the local values are. Are things like high taxes or cutting the defense budget politically acceptable or not? How much welfare state is already in place and is it effective? Each country has its own individual path to a UBI. The easiest way to pay for a UBI is to end all welfare and use the free funds to finance it. Not only would this make a number of government agencies disappear, which in itself saves money, it would also eliminate a lot of bureaucracy. On the other hand, cutting them could leave many people worse off than before. If the goal is to have a foundation for everybody, there still need to be programs of some sort, because just like countries, people are not the same. The second way, higher taxes, especially for the very wealthy. In the US, for example, there's been a lot of economic growth, but most of the benefits from it have gone to the richest few percent. The wealth gap is rapidly widening, and many argue that it might be time to distribute the spoils more evenly to preserve the social peace. There could be taxes on financial transactions, capital, land value, carbon, or even robots. But UBI is not necessarily expensive. According to a recent study, a UBI of $1,000 per month in the US could actually grow the GDP by 12% over eight years because it would enable poor people to spend more and increase overall demand. What about the people who do the dirty work? Who will work in the fields, crawl through sewers or lift pianos? If you don't need to for survival, will people still do hard, boring and unfulfilling labor? UBI might give them enough leverage to demand better pay and working conditions. A study calculated that every extra dollar going to wage earners would add about $1.21 to the national economy, while every extra dollar going to high-income Americans would add only 39 cents. There would still be very rich and poor people, but we could eliminate fear, suffering and existential panic for a significant part of the population. Making poor citizens better off could be a smart economic tactic. For some, this isn't enough. They want a UBI large enough to live a middle-class existence. If we set the financial obstacle aside, this idea fundamentally challenges how our society is constructed. By earning money, you earn the possibility to take part in society. This determines your status and options, but it also forces many people into spending huge chunks of their time on things they don't care about. In 2016, only 33% of US employees were engaged at work, 16% were actively miserable, and the remaining 51% were only physically present. Would 67% of people stop working if they could? It would be unfair to portray work as just a chore. Work gives us something to do. It challenges us. It motivates us to improve. It forces us to engage. Many find friends or partners at work. We work for social status, wealth and our place in the world. We're looking for something to do with our lives. And for many people, work gives them meaning. 
There are other concerns with UBI. If all welfare programs were exchanged for one single payment, this gives the government a lot of leverage. Individual programs are easier to attack or cut than a multitude. Or populists might promise drastic changes to the UBI to get into power. And a universal basic income doesn't tackle all problems when it comes to inequality. Rents, for example. While $1,000 might be great in the countryside, it's not a lot for expensive metropolitan areas, which could lead to poor people moving outwards and the difference between rich and poor becoming even more extreme. And of course, for some people, the concept of work itself not being essential for survival is appalling. So is the universal basic income a good idea? The honest answer is that we don't know yet. There needs to be a lot more research, more and bigger test runs. We need to think about what kind of UBI we want and what we're prepared to give up to pay for it. The potential is huge. It might be the most promising model to sustainably eliminate poverty. It might seriously reduce the amount of desperation in the world and make us all much less stressed out. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places.